We welcome you in to our homes, episode number 30 of the best podcast available for 2020. We have reached 30 episodes. We continue to chug on. I'm Jason Gibbs alongside Andrew Gribble. Going through the virtual offseason, only three weeks left of the virtual offseason Gribbs. And uh, again, 30 episodes. We've seen quite a lot here in the last... 12 plus weeks that we've been doing this. Yeah, I mean, we've covered free agency, we've covered the draft, schedule release, off-season program. It's been a whole lot. And it's crazy to think this was the week last year the Browns had mandatory minicamp. So, I mean, this is this would usually be your final week uh, of the program. I, I went back and looked. We had stories about Odell Beckham's first press conference with uh, during this time of year. I mean, the guys were done by by Thursday of this week. So it is going to stretch a little bit longer, but it's just been so different with without any actual football happening here. Yeah, I, I totally forgot last year. We we normally were done that weekend going into or that week going into Father's Day weekend. And yeah. last year we were done a week early. I totally yeah, actually and, and I, I messed it up. It was done last week. It was the first week of, of June. You know, it was, it was June 3rd, 4th, and 5th, I believe, last year. Yeah. So they, they got it done early last year. So it, 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 it is, this is a longer off-season program. It's just completely different. Well, and the longer this virtual off-season goes, the more apparent it, it seems to be that barring some kind of last-minute change or vote or correction, you know, there won't be anything involving the players in the football building and on the football field until training camp. And speaking of that, Albert Breer – from MMQB, the MMQB.com, with his weekly Monday morning column. And, and he's got a few things about us coming back and teams coming back in general. Uh, bear with me as I go through. We're going we're gonna to talk through three of these topics coming up on the podcast, though, today. We are excited as our Get to Know You segment continues on the best podcast available. New linebacker coach Jason Tarver going to join us today excited about that uh the man with a wealth of knowledge and experiences especially on the west coast a lot of time with the raiders with the 49ers with stanford as well and uh, look forward to hearing from him most recently with vanderbilt so looking forward to getting to know him as our get to know you segment continues on the best podcast available but talking cba talking about when we can return, what that might look like. And his first note, the new CBA dictates teams can report 47 days before their first regular season game, a change from the old 14-day rule, meaning the report date for most teams would be July 28th. Meanwhile, the Joint Committee on Health and Safety is recommending an acclimation period before camp. Maybe we should just call that the Alabama rule. Given the lack of football activity these guys have had, of at least a week or two and up to three. The good news is the new CBA builds in a five-day acclimation period. Bad news is players may need to move, may need more than that under these unique circumstances. So the league has floated the idea of an earlier report date closer to the middle of July to give players a better chance to get their feet underneath them. Long-winded, but uh, a good explanation from Albert Breer on that. Grims, do you see that happening? Do you see the Players Association agreeing to something like that? Yeah, it's just going to depend on on how important they they value these preseason games because you need these guys to to be ready to go and and you don't want to uh, put them in any harm's way. And I think that you know you don't want to put anyone in harm's way, but but all the all the underlying things you see there may lead me to believe that we might see even less of the starters in in preseason situations because there there might be the added risk there because the acclimation period. I mean, look at what the NBA is doing with how much time they're devoting to really gearing these guys up to get ready to play. Everyone's wondering, like, why does this take so long? And, and it's all the medical experts saying these guys need weeks uh, to get ready to train and, and be ready to play uh, basketball. And I think the same thing's going to apply to football. It's That's going to be a hard thing to negotiate, though, is getting these guys back mid-July. I mean, that's just not the the norm, uh, That especially after they've already had their off-season programs go a little bit deeper into June uh, than they typically have before. All right. Um, the union also has been understandably protective of the players vacation time. And that's one of the reasons why I think the thought across the league is there won't be anybody in their buildings 
uh, until training camp. The desires of the individual players are all over the map. Rookie and 10-year bet going to have different needs and priorities. One more extreme option that's been discussed if the union holds firm on the report date is the idea of canceling the first week of preseason games to allow for an acclimation period and enough actual football practice before players head into live action. Gribs, with the guys not having been in the building at all and not getting back into the building until training camp, do you see a preseason game being canceled or two? I mean, it's certainly something that they may consider. I mean, I, I would imagine that they're going to probably – you want to try to preserve that as much as possible. I mean, what about the Hall of Fame game that's a week earlier than, than the, the rest of those preseason games? I mean, those could be tough. Uh, I, I imagine that the, the league and, and even the players probably want to protect those preseason games as much as possible. I mean, those – you don't – you really don't know what the fan situation will be, but you want to get those kind of games in. I think that they can be important. Uh, for just kind of establishing uh, maybe normalcy, a, a, a rhythm to the schedule, and, and get guys used to, to getting ready for these situations. So I, I imagine that everything's being considered, but I, I would maybe see that as maybe one of your la later options on the table if something else doesn't work before that. Yeah, I really – these guys are going to need all the time that they can possibly have. I, I was reading something over the weekend – you know, Matt Nagy, the Bears coach, obviously he's got a little quarterback controversy on his hands. Everybody thinks it's just going to be Nick Foles' job. He keeps reiterating that Trubisky is going to have just the same equal opportunity. And he said, unlike previous preseasons and preseason games and training camp where you protect your older guys and your veterans, he said, I'm going to have to play these guys. I'm going to have to play them a lot. They might have to play all four preseason games for me to get a read on, on who our best option is going into the season. I, I, you're, and you're right. I just – I cannot see it unless it is a last-ditch option of canceling preseason games this year. If you have a normal offseason next year, obviously everything goes back on the table. And, you know, we'll see what happens here with the preseason. But I, you need every minute of every day. You know, in the past, practices for training camp gribs have been two hours. And yeah. sometimes they end at an hour 40, hour 45. These are going to go two hours for training camp practices. Yeah, you're going to want to make the most of your opportunities because it's one of those things where you're going to be testing guys. You're going to be, I mean, it, you, you, got, you got to get the most out of these guys being on the field because you've, you're already making up for lost time. You're never going to get that time back. Uh, and you're right. There's, it's obviously the quarterback decisions get the biggest exposure, but you know you've got teams making decisions on every part of the field, and they they need to see these guys play, see what kind of shape they're in, uh, ever everything like that. So I mean, you, you're going to need to 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 maximize every bit of of time you get with these guys. Yeah, you're going to need to get them in shape. <laughs> I yes. mean, the, the guys are working out right now, but again, there's a difference between working out in shape and game shape. And that's oh, yeah. going to take a process to get to that point. Yeah. So. I mean, the, 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 that workout time is in the spring is so huge for these guys because it's just – it's it's as as well conditioned and trained as you can be on your own. It's so different when you go go into a, a gym with the guys and, and are actually playing football. Yeah, no question. The final note from Albert Breer in his Monday morning quarterback column, moving the season back to an October start is one option I know some teams support – it would allow for the NFL to observe how other leagues start back up, watch them do things right and wrong, and buy more time for all of this stuff. But the league office has not been receptive at all to this idea. And at this point, changing the dates of the season would have to be negotiated with the union as well. That said, there's flexibility to move the Super Bowl if needed, which creates that option. I don't think anybody wants to move anything when it comes to this timeline regarding the NFL groups. No, but did, didn't uh, at ESPN report that there's some built-in flexibility with the schedule with the first four weeks, you move those to the last four weeks. So it does seem like they can do it if they have to. It's just, a, it's, it all goes back to that discussion that was had about free agency, about the draft, like who knows if it's going to be any better a month from now. So why don't we just do this now? You know, and I think that might be the prevailing factor, especially with all this talk about, you know, what about the winter if, if, it, if, it, if it makes a comeback and more people are being infected. You might want to try to get these games in in September when things are better than 
wait and 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 put yourself in a real bind if if, if the health conditions kind of worsen uh, around the around the world. So that I, I I can understand the reluctance to that. I I could see the practicality in really waiting, uh, but there is a danger in waiting because it it does you're not guaranteed things are going to be better. I mean that's that's the that 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 is the one underlying uh, danger in waiting. But in a perfect scenario where you're guaranteed things would be better, obviously waiting would be better. I mean, I think that would be that that is the perfect scenario, but you 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 can't be guaranteed that. I would like to not play Thursday night football in the middle of January. If yeah. we can avoid <laughs> that, I would be a big fan of that. Right. I mean, it's just it's it, it it's a unique year. And I think the NBA is going to really be the test case on what it's like to see their sport at a different time of year. Uh, and, and maybe the NFL will have to, to, to go to that scenario, but I feel like they're going to try to come up with any kind of scenario that, that avoids that. Yeah. All right. Those are some of the, the topics being discussed. We do know on Monday that teams got uh, a manual from the league on the protocols they're going to have to have for training camp. Uh, that's going to require a deep dive and a lot more looking through things before we're able to talk, talk about mm -hmm. what is and what is not going to be uh, on the table for teams as 2020 NFL training camps begin to open a little more than a month and a half from now, at least slated to open a month and a half from now. All right, that's a look at what's going on around the league as it pertains to training camps opening. We're all going to be mindful and watching in the weeks and days ahead to see what the league does, what our plans are, how it affects us, <laughs> whether we're going to be traveling, not traveling. A lot of questions still to be determined between now and when camps open. Time now for our best of and get to know you segments on the best podcast available. Happy to be joined this week by new Browns linebacker coach Jason Tarver, a wealth of knowledge and experience. He's been in Oakland with the Raiders, the 49ers. He's been with Stanford the last couple of years at Vanderbilt University. So excited to have him on board and coaching this defense. He brings a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, and uh, excited to get to hear from our new linebacker coach. Have a watch and have a listen. Here on the best podcast available, happy to be joined by our new linebacker coach as we continue to meet a lot of the new faces in our front office and in our coaching staff. Jason Tarver joins us. And coach, welcome to Cleveland. A little bit cooler than Nashville this time of year where, uh, where you were at, at Vanderbilt the last couple of years. Yes, sir. Great to be here. Excited. Coach, uh, just walk me through what uh, the off-season program has been for you, been like for you, and and how how much you've had to adapt to what you're usually doing this time of year. Well, you, you know what it's it's been fun because it's finding new ways to to get players information. So we're able to record videos, we're able to do a lot of different things and get them information and check it. The guys have been they've really worked and they've competed. When, when we're in meetings, they're, they're competing to get the answers right first. So that's been, been really good to see. Uh, it took work early, meaning putting things together. But, but that's what we do as coaches. We just watch video and, and put clips together of the Browns, of the different places we're going to take from, you know, to add to Coach Woods' scheme. So it was a, it was a lot of legwork early to make videos sooner. Is it tougher when you're in a meeting to to make sure your message is resonating, or how do you how, how do you get the vibes from players when that that something really is clicking with them? Well, when it, when it, when you're presenting with some of the cool functions of these you know these online meetings, is you can be looking at what they're doing. You know, you can see if their camera's facing the ceiling, or if they're <laughs> pretending to take notes, or if they're really taking notes. So uh, some of that's been really good. Our guys have been outstanding in the meetings. Yeah. The linebacker position group, they're, they're hungry to learn. And we, we had one miss for a family thing, but we've had almost 100% attendance. It's been awesome. That's, that's a very, very good thing, especially all things considered in the world right now. Uh, Jason Tarver, our guest, the Browns' new linebacker coach. Coach, what, uh, what attracted you to this position? and uh, a spot on Joe Wood's staff and Kevin Stefanski's staff, ultimately? Well, a lot of things. Um, one was the opportunity to get back in the NFL. Uh, very excited about that. 
Two was the type of people we're bringing into the organization. Uh, they're honest, they're smart. Um, having worked with Joe Woods, he's intelligent. And they got both men, Kevin and Joe, have the ability to focus in the moment and stay in the moment, uh, to quote Phil Jackson, because we all saw the, the Michael Jordan <laughs> stuff, right? But that was one of Phil's favorite things to stay in the moment. Both men are very focused, very honest, and you're just excited as a player or a coach to be around their personality. And coach, you, you've got one of the younger groups on, on the team. And I'm just wondering, what, what do you like about that kind of challenge going into a, a group with some guys with potential, but, but not, not a lot of guys that have played a lot, a lot in the NFL so far? Well, the first thing you've got to do, and, and Coach Stefanski says it really well, is work. Uh, our group is working right now. And what's great is, is they all come from different backgrounds with Sione and Mac and Jacob, and I don't want to leave anybody out, so the other guys are all included too, but I'm not <laughs> going to read off everybody's name at the moment. Okay, but they, they know that they need to learn more, and that can be very powerful, but they also know who they are, and we're trying to bring that out in them, their identity. Every, everyone has an identity as a football player, and we want them to be them, their best selves, and you need to show that identity every day. So regardless of what's going on, be you. Um, you know, like certain guys wear shirts in the meeting all the time. Other guys don't because they're at their houses, right? But they need to be them because that's how you become your best self in anything, not just in football. So that's one, is live your identity. And then two, realize you don't know everything. None of us do. We're all constantly learning or else we're in trouble. And the group has been really good with those two things. So that's what excites us. And how does a player like a like a BJ Goodson who comes in? How does how does someone like that establish leadership during these kind of settings right now? Well, it's it's interesting. We start a lot of the our our meetings with that, like, hey, listen, tell me something good that happened over the weekend. Just that in the interaction, that's one of the greatest things as a coach is is to be around guys get that want to get better and are getting better all the time. I mean, simple questions like that, you hear their personalities. BJ's been wonderful in the meeting as well, because he has played a little bit more uh, with a lot of different teams. So there's certain things that he's experienced. Uh, we talk a lot about what it's supposed to look like. So I've been fortunate to be around some great ones and coach on all three phases in football. And so every once in a while, there'll be a PowerPoint that says a big pitcher and pitcher will fly in and says, who's this? And then we'll, we'll get words of wisdom from, from players that have coached or or Coach Bloom is coach that's with us in, in the linebacker room. And, and those lessons can be very valuable in this setting because we're not all of them. So we work on, we work on a few of those every week and start discussions and, and talk about what it's going to be like in the middle of the fourth quarter in a tight game in the NFL. This is what it feels like so that they can remember and pull back on that when it does get, get there because we're going to be in them. Coach, you have, I have a young linebacker room uh, and two guys last year, uh, one that played a lot and one that came on toward the end of the year in Sione Takitaki and obviously Mac Wilson. Um, a lot of people will tell you in the league, the greatest improvement is from year one to year two in a young player. These guys have to improve with a new coaching staff, a new scheme, and have to do it virtually <laughs> right now. Um, what are the biggest challenges? What have you talked to them about? And, and what are your expectations in those two from year one to year two? Well, I think for all of us, there's three things. Number one right now with what's going on in the world and in the country is our safety. Our safety for our family, our safety for ourselves. We talk about that all the time with the guys. And they've been great about that. Two is... is coming into this scheme this offseason, we really got to own the scheme. What that means is it's not a, just knowing, hey, we're going to do, you know, cover three, cover four, blitz. Everybody does some of that. But it's really owning it. It's understanding the ins and outs of what words we have to say to help the DBs and the linebackers, knowing where we fit in the defense. What's awesome about being a linebacker is how it got its name. You're backed off the line. You're behind the line and in front of the DBs. And that's the best place that you're in the middle of all of it. It was great. And they can only do two things. They can run or they can pass. Now, like the other, they're both, right? 
So we're going to get our eyes right. But that's what's great about being a linebacker. We're in the middle of it. So we need to own that scheme. Our, our young men have done a really good job of studying it, quizzing each other. We have different ways we quiz them. So that's one. And then two is getting in shape. And that's a challenge in this environment. Our guys have done a very good job so far of, of doing drills and, and things that we require them to. And I think that'll continue. Um, but that's different because it's on your own. You're used to being around people. So specifically to answer your question about the two young men that are working between their first and their second year, that's what you miss is that being around your teammate in that time. Because it really is their first off season. And there's more time in the NFL off season on your own than there is when you're going to college, obviously classes and the things you got to do. So that's one of the learning curves. But we speak on that a lot. And how different do you expect it to be at least early on when you finally get these guys back on the field, but they hadn't done it in the spring? I mean, how, how different could that be for you than what you've usually done in, in the years past? Well, I think, I think it's the same being this way. Here's what I mean by that. The process is still going to be the same, but you got to be able to take it from the classroom out to the field. And the walkthroughs where you practice communication with your teammates so we can get all 11 defensive guys flying around and attacking the ball and the different things that we want to have as our identity and show as our identity, we still got to start that way. We still got to line up and talk to each other and get ready to play. So the only thing is, is you didn't do that in the offseason together. You've simulated it, but you haven't done it as much. So it's checking that first and making sure that we can function together. And we've asked a lot of people this. What what about this last few months has made you maybe appreciate parts of coaching that you never appreciated before or, or parts of the game that, that you, you maybe didn't appreciate as much now that you've been in this situation? Oh, this might be a long answer. Uh, I've learned so much about myself uh, having an education background and teaching for parents and siblings and everything. Uh, I tr we some of the meetings are recorded, so I'm trying. I'm a perfectionist, so I'm trying to make them perfect. And and the good part about that is you can see yourself grow as a coach. You can you can really get better at making it concise so the guys can understand. It. That's been a challenge, and that's been fun to do. Uh, two is doing it from home, so you'll be in the middle of meetings like this. I'm surprised my boys haven't run around behind us yet and started <laughs> yelling stuff at me. Um, but there's more things going on, you know, and it's been cool as a football coach that have two little boys to be able to coach them as well. Sometimes that gets lost, especially in a first year off season, because your first year moving into somewhere, uh, there's just more things that go on. Right. And for doing that from home this year was unique and pretty cool. More time with the family, more time to perfect how, how quickly and how directly we can coach. That's been, that's been exciting, and that's been helpful. Jason Tarver, the Browns' new linebacker coach, our guest here on the best podcast available. Coach, to follow that up, what was the draft process like? Uh, from one-on-one -on -one in-person interviews not happening, I mean, essentially we were all together at the NFL Combine, and that was it. So what was the draft process like? And talk about that draft weekend essentially, and where you guys were all at working remotely with a lot of help from uh, some great IT people in our department. Oh, heck yeah. The, the IT did a great job setting everything up. I mean, it's been great. I'm, I'm on my stuff that they set up for me at home, sending me different cables to have lots of screens. Uh, you know, what was kind of, what was really cool is having the family around. And of course the, the broadcast showed that, but you know, when, when in, you do, it was cool to have the family kind of come behind and go, what's going on? So that was good. Process-wise, uh, very more. We we did a good job as as an organization of, of watching video on our own and then getting together and talking about it. That was really good. We spent a little more time with the young men on Zoom calls and on calling than than because you couldn't visit the pro day. So that was the biggest difference. Uh, got to know a lot of our guys, including Jacob and Solomon, our two young linebackers, through that process. Uh, both of whom were very excited about. So. That was actually really good. You could really get to know some of the some of the young men in the draft and rooting for the ones that, that we weren't able to get to because you only get one out of every 32 sometimes. Sometimes you get a couple of extra picks, and we did a good job of doing that. So that part was unique, getting to know them through Zoom kind of like this, getting to know them just by talking. Um, but 
I do, I do like as a coach going to pro days because you get to see them in their environment. So that was the part that we missed. What's what's it been like for the co defensive coaching staff coming together throughout the throughout this? I know you were one of Joe's earlier hires in the process, but what how have you guys kind of come together as a staff during these times? Well, I think both Joe again, both Joe and Kevin picked off of our personality types, picking. Uh, knowing what they wanted around to surround themselves with as, as both as people and as coaches. That's been fun too, because the, the early morning zoom meetings, sometimes you maybe aren't doing as much skiing. It's just the same thing. Just start and start talking because you're used to being in a room with people and then now you're not. So sometimes it's inside jokes or, or sometimes it's going straight to ball. Um, it's been good though. A, a, a lot of us, had known of each other, but hadn't necessarily worked together. So, and we did get a lot of time in the home office right before it broke as a defensive staff. And, and we, we've been able to go through both our schemes a couple times already all the way through. So one time in the facility and then another time on Zoom meetings as we're installing it with the players. And what do you like most about his scheme and, and specifically with what, what the linebackers role is within that scheme? Uh, everybody gets to do everything. It is, it is, all about the football. It is attacking. It is will we'll line up and look the same and be able to do different things out of the same looks, be it that pressure or zone or man or whatever Coach Woods wants to call. So it, it can it can be multiple but still simple, and that's exciting. So it plays fast for the front seven. There are certain things that you have to be able to deal with in each coverage. Uh, just like any defense, but this defense and Coach Woods in particular does a really good job of players and coaches understanding those issues and being able to play fast within it. Because every defense has a weakness and every defense has a strength, but Joe teaches it really well. So you can, when you master this thing, it plays fast. All right. So I've seen a few videos of you as a motivator. Um, not every coach can motivate and, and there's a happy medium between motivating, teaching and yelling at a guy cause he did the wrong thing. I know this, I was a former, I, I, I played not football, but I got plenty yelled at by coaches growing up. Uh, what, uh, what is that happy medium when it comes to that? Because, uh, a lot of things I've read about you and seen you're, you're quite the motivator behind the scenes. Well, one, I appreciate that. Two, I don't know where you got all those videos. No, I'm not kidding. But uh, it, it's this. It's the same thing we're talking about with identity. It's being yourself every day. Uh, I love coming to work. I love what I do. I love the challenge of helping people work together to do something they could not do on their own. That's why I got it's so into this. Football is teaching with adrenaline. It is exciting but you got to get it done and you got to communicate sometimes really quickly uh so motivation just comes from me i'm not i'm ex i'm i have high energy because that's what the guys deserve you know uh, i'm gonna and i'm gonna be the same every day it's something that i'm gonna pride myself on is it, and we want to be that too we want to be the same every day we want to show our identity every day. so uh i'm not as much of a a, a yeller really I only really yell if somebody's going to hurt themselves or they're not in their own mind. You know, it, it's, if you're out of your own mind, like something's wrong. So then you got to find out what's wrong and, and fix it. And you fix it fast. But more than that, it's, a, it's teaching with adrenaline. It's excitement, but it's getting the point across so that we can learn from what happened. Cause you're going to make mistakes. Everybody does, but how quickly can you learn? All right. One final one here, coach, and we'll get you out of here. We appreciate new Browns linebacker coach, Jason Tarver, spending a few minutes with us today on the best podcast available. Bill Walsh, Steve Mariucci, Mike Singletary, Derek Mason, Bob Toledo, David Shaw, just to name a few, just to name a few of the coaches that, that you've been uh, blessed enough to work with. What's the best piece of advice you've gotten in terms of working from those guys? Oh, wow. You could go down, you could go down the list. Um, Coach Walsh did a nice job of, of bringing a 24 year old into the building and making sure that every Friday checking on and really asking hard questions. What'd you learn this week? Why, what are you thinking? Did you get this done? Uh, he put the playbook down and said, 
you know, you got a week, memorize this, and it was the West Coast offense playbook. It's famous now, right? And I was on offense at that time. So he came in to the, this will be a quick story, but it's a good one. He came in Friday and said, you know, what's the longest play? And I rattled it off. And he, and he kind of looked at me funny. And I said, what's the next question? He goes, nobody ever got the first one right. I'm like, well, you told me to read the book. So there's some things like that training. Coach Mariucci was wonderful with how, just how to run a team meeting and, and treat people. Treat people from the media to everything. Be yourself and treat them with respect. That's what I learned from Coach Mariucci. You asked about motivation. Mike Singletary was outstanding. Um, Dave Shaw, we want to talk about an amazing person that's the same every day. That's, that's him. Uh, I could keep going. If I left you out, I'm sorry, Coach. Uh, but that's our job as a coach is to get better every day and take something from everybody. So as much as I, I could uh, learn in any of those situations, that's what I was doing. And hopefully we can translate that to our, to our young men. Coach, couldn't say it any better. Appreciate the time, and we wish you all the best. Safe travels on, on the move to Cleveland. Can't wait to see you up here full-time. Can't wait to be in the building again, and, and can't wait to get these guys on the field, and let's get the 2020 season going. Be safe and continued success, sir. Thank you for the time today. Thank you. It was good talking to you guys, and we're excited to move up there. Time to get started. Thanks to Jason Tarver, New Browns linebacker coach, for a few minutes of his time. Gribble takeaways from Coach Tarver and his interview with us on the best podcast available. Well, I said he's he's a passionate guy, and I bet it, I'd love to get some footage of the, some of those meetings that he's had to conduct uh, via Zoom. But you know, of the position coaches, he's got one of the biggest challenges right now. It's a young room, uh, and then your one veteran is a new guy on the team, and everyone's learning a new scheme anyways. So uh, he he's. I like his philosophy and what he's trying to get these guys ready for, but they're, they're going to be under the microscope the moment they get uh, into Berea and ready for training camp. And, and we'll have to, we'll, we'll the, all focus will be on them. Cause honestly, it, it, I think all three positions are up for grabs at those linebacker spots. We think Mac Wilson's going to figure factor in somewhere, just a matter of where he, where he's best going to line up for this team. Yeah. And does Phillips have a big impact right off the get go? Or does he take a little bit of time to develop? You know, I mean, it. Taki Taki was on his way last year to, to having an impact away, and then he got hurt. And, yeah. uh, and that goes back to what we talked about earlier in the podcast. You have to worry about guys, and hopefully everybody comes to camp in shape and ready to go. And, you know, it takes one injury to really put you behind the eight ball. And uh, it, it will be interesting to see how that whole room, you know, comes together here. Uh, I, I do like him. I think he fits right in with the coaching staff and the other coaches, though. Everybody, everybody's on the same page. And I know we say it, and it's a broken record, and we say it every week, but it's true. You listen to them, and they, everybody fits right in line with what the top, uh, top half of the ownership group, the GM, and the coach are all about. Yeah, and I like that Tarver's got – he's got coordinator experience, which is always important. And I think there's a good level of understanding when you go from being a coordinator to a position coach, especially when it comes to implementing a new system. I think that that, that experience will, will definitely uh, be important as the season comes, comes closer. Yeah, no question about it. We appreciate his time. And again, you can check out his interview if you missed any part of it. Same with Glenn Cook from last week, our new vice president of player personnel. You can log on to clevelandbrowns.com or wherever you get your podcast. Also watch it on the Browns YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Browns. All right, no peeking. I, I, I put out the rules. I put them out, and everybody has adhered to it, which is great. Joe Thomas, our good friend, former Browns player, Browns great, listed his top five players he's played with during his time here. Gribbs, can you guess them from five to one? Oh, so I got to go five to one. Okay, that's tough. All right. Uh, I mean, uh, all right. You want to just do the five and then I'll ask yeah. you to rank them? We can do that. Okay. Uh, my first one, I think, is a lock, and that would be Alex Mack. Correct. Correct. Okay. I mean, the, the way he's talked about Alex Mack anytime you talk about I mean, immediate respect. They're good friends. Everything. I think that was an easy one. Secondly, I will go with Miles Garrett. Yes. I think two that, for two. 
very short amount of time together, but clearly was very impressed with him. Three, let's go with Joe Hayden. Not on the list. Okay. And, and that one that I got wrong too, because when I first saw the article, I, I out loud, I said to myself, all right, it's got to be blah, 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 blah. And then I went and looked and no, Joe Hayden, not one of the five. What about Josh Cribbs? Josh Cribbs is on that list, my friend. Right. Here's the here here's the controversial one. Josh Gordon. No. No. Not okay. Josh. No. Okay. So I'll give you I'll give you I'll give you two give me, more give answers. Give me positions. Uh <laughs> well, if I give you one position. Okay, then okay, then all right, then Phil Dawson. Yes. Okay. That's one. <laughs> And then the other one would be on the offensive side of the football. Okay. Joel Batonio? No, not Joel Batonio, okay. but offensive lineman. Is it Eric Steinbach? <laughs> good guess and a good pull by you. I mean, no, Mitchell Schwartz. Ah, yeah. Yeah, that's. So he had Dawson five. Cribs four, Schwartz three, Miles Garrett two, and Alex Mack one. You got the first two right off the bat. Which yeah, those those good. are the easy ones. Yeah, I, I can't believe I forgot about Mitchell. But Mitchell, I mean, his his career really took off with the Chiefs. To, yes. to starting to get the acclaim that he was getting, I, I think that from Joe's perspective, I, I think he was maybe not getting the appreciation they probably should have uh, during that time. But clearly, even nationally, Mitchell Schwartz was started really getting recognized with Kansas City. Yes, no question about it. Unfortunately, just uh, another regime change he was the victim of, Mitchell yeah. Schwartz. And so he left and went on to greener pastures, and he's got himself a Super Bowl ring, which is a good thing because he really is a good guy behind the scenes. So, I mean, a little controversy between Alex Mack and Miles Garrett, though. I mean, I don't know, if maybe if Joe had a couple more years of Miles – that, that Miles opinion. might be number one. Miles might have been number one. Yeah. I think technically they only practiced against each other like once. Yeah. So in, in, in terms of full go reps, that was, I think they only had one practice. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah. Alex Mack, uh, well thought of by oh, our yeah. Joe Thomas. There's no question about that. But two special teamers and Phil Dawson and Josh Cribbs making that list as well. Well, Cribs, Cribs played a good amount of offense with, with Joe Thomas, so he got to see him on, on the offense side as well. A little wildcat action. Yeah, a lot of wildcats, some, some wide receiver. I mean, he, he, got, a, he got the full dose of, of Josh Cribs. I, 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 I thought about Phil Dawson earlier. I, just, I, I was wondering if he was going to mix it up. I was, I, I was going to pull deep in my bag. I was going to go to maybe a TJ Ward. Were we going to get a DeQuell Jackson in there? I, I like the Hayden pull. The Hayden pull was a great guess. And a couple other people that I asked that question to, they said Joe Hayden um, and a Steinbach. Is it, Steinbach is it just because it's just because the tackles and corners live in different worlds. Yeah, and I think that I mean they're opposite sides of the practice field. You don't go up against each other. I mean you don't get the first hand, you know. And we've seen Joe Thomas kick some field goals, so maybe he appreciates Phil Dawson a little bit more, even though they didn't spend a ton of time of practice with each other. But he did block on field goals, so maybe that's why he got to work with him closely. Yeah, no question. Uh, nice little, little, nice little top five list from our own Joe Thomas. All right, that's going to wrap up episode thirty of the best podcast available. Thanks to Browns linebacker coach Jason Tarver. Thanks to Jeff McDaniel for all of his hard work behind the scenes, as well as Browns PR guru Mike Anarella for all of his hard work in lining up Coach Tarver and all of our guests week in and week out. The whole PR department does an outstanding job helping us out with that make sure you log on to clevelandbrowns.com or wherever you get your podcasts like and subscribe today to the best podcast available you can also check us out on youtube as i mentioned earlier youtube.com slash browns for andrew gribble i'm jason gibbs we're back with you on thursday for another edition of the best podcast available thanks for watching and thanks for listening to the best podcast available <laughs>